And basically what they're doing is creating wild lands and national heritage sites and all these fancy names, which is just regionalization and it's partnering government with um, private interests, which just means that we're losing our constitutional rights and we're being um, squeezed off of wild lands and, and the farmland and out in the country they want to push us all into cities where they have total control. And they're using the environmental movement and particularly the NGOs, which the Rockefellers and other entities fund, to trick us into thinking we're protecting the environment when what they're really doing is taking it away from us so they can have it all. Uh, that's probably the best explanation I've heard of putting it into those kind of words that, I, that I've heard. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Um, Loren, one question I've had, and I've been studying this issue somewhat since we have uh, right here in our own San Luis Valley uh, some of these dramas playing out as we speak. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm reading articles about Agenda 21 and finding out, you know, that this goes back to, I think, a, a, a U.N. document uh, uh, back in the early 90s, which about 150 or 130 nations have now signed on to, including the U.S. Uh, but most of the articles that I read about Agenda 21 uh, are from the 90s, and they they really lambast Clinton for uh, you know selling us out and Gore for selling us out. And I and I really it could be just the the uh, coincidence, but I haven't read that much uh, updated of what the impact of the Bush administration has been on moving us towards this Agenda 21, which uh, if, if you look at some of the documents of the Wildland Project, they, they want to make 50% of the United States uh, public land, and that all sounds good if, if, when you think that they're trying to save the wildlife, but in fact, as you say, they're trying to uh, consolidate their control of essential resources, which they can then sell to their corporate buddies for cheap. Um, so my, my question is, uh, is, is Agenda 21 moving forward apace under Bush uh, over uh, since the year 2000? I would say, I would say it, it, it's at triple speed now. It's at triple speed, okay. Yeah, it, it's much faster. It's happening very quickly. Um, it's global, but we're seeing it locally or regionally. And um, it's horrifying because uh, the dollar is crashing. They're deliberately doing that. And as soon as the presidential election is over, um, they're going to take the dollar down really fast. You can see um, uh, energy prices going up, petroleum or gasoline prices going up. And um, this has the effect of, of locking people in uh, to their neighborhoods because they can't really afford to go much further. And um, uh, Americans are used to very cheap uh, petroleum. I, I, just a few years ago, I was paying a dollar and a quarter a gallon for gas. And uh, this, this triple increase is resulting in uh, food price increases, in restriction of movement, in uh, a huge increase in airplane fares. That's just starting to happen for instance, I wanted to fly from Calgary in Alberta, in the Canadian Rockies, to San Francisco um, last Wednesday, and the airplane ticket was $129, which, you know, was very reasonable. But then I discovered that the taxes and the increased fuel price on top of the $129 was an additional one hundred and forty eight dollars which was even more than the ticket so um, these are the uh, the real impacts of this uh, global agenda and it's to pin us down restrict our movements um, also I've been following the oil companies because I'm a ge geologist and I've been going to you know GSA and AAAS and other scientific meetings for 40 years. And uh, what is happening is the over the last 10 or 20 years, uh, the oil companies have been consolidated globally into three major oil companies. British Petroleum is one of them. 
Shell is another one. And then uh, I've forgotten what the third one is. But Exxon. <laughs> Exxon, right. Exxon but, Mobil, yeah. Yeah, but the city Thank of you, London. Thank you, Rockefeller, yes. The yep. city of London owns all three of those oil companies. So, yeah. so where does the Queen come in in that? Uh, the Queen? Mm-hmm. Well, um, the Queen has um, her own, uh, the royal family has their own wealth, and then there are crown, or I should say royal family residences and land that they own. I've, I've heard that, I, I worked at Cambridge University for a while, and I was told that you can walk from one end of, of England to the other on royal family property uh, without <laughs> without stepping on public land, and um, it's uh, they they have tremendous wealth in their colonies as well, um, but they are really under the control and the command of the international bankers in the city of London, and what's interesting is that. Um, Princess Diana was selected as a broodmare for Prince Charles because of her bloodlines. And people thought it was the Spencer bloodlines, which indeed make her actually more royal than um, the house of anyone in the House of Windsor, which is Queen Elizabeth's family. Uh, they're actually German usurpers on the, on the British throne. But I discovered in Japan, in a, in a two-volume book on the Rothschilds, that actually Princess Diana's mother is a Rothschild. And that's what I heard. Joan Beyond was And so Prince William will be the first Rothschild on the throne. And something to confirm that even more is that um, I discovered in an article, everybody listening should read this, it's called The Rothschild Octopus. And it's all about the spider web they've set up of control all over the world. And what I discovered is Jacob Rothschild restored Spencer House in London out of his own pocket or a family trust. And that was the London Palace of the Spencers, uh, where they lived from uh, 1750s until about 1900. And it took a lot of money to restore that. He was very, very good friends with Princess Diana. And so it, it, it's my opinion and my viewpoint that um, he's setting up the Spencers and the Rothschilds and um, the history of their past. He's marrying the Rothschilds to the Spencer history. And uh, Prince William will be, when he's King William, will be uh, the culmination of this very carefully carried out and engineered plan. Isn't that wild? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's interesting. Melody sent me that same link to the Rothschild Oct- Octopus uh, oh, uh, article, which I did read and, and downloaded, and, and it's very important, as you say. There's there's the, quite a number of things out about the Rothschilds now. Um, and it does seem that they have uh, enormous wealth and power and, and, and a... And a and uh, may may indeed be running the world. Uh, Actually, they're nouveau riche. They were they've only been uh, involved with the the London bankers since about the 1750s, and um, it's because um, Christians were never allowed to do money lending or banking from the time Christianity formed uh, in the Roman Empire until the mid 1700s. In the mid-1700s, um, the Christian Church allowed Christians to become bankers and money lenders. So the city of London bankers, who go all the way back to Mesopotamia, um, reorganized themselves, and they selected Meyer Amschel, who was a banker in um, Frankfurt, along with the Goldsmiths and uh, the Oppenheimers, and he was selected to uh, become the public face because he had five sons on the very secretive London bankers. So most of the public names that we'll be mentioning 
even though they may be multi-billionaires or very public people, they are just the face and the contractors for the very hidden personalities and very powerful entities that are within the City of London walls, the ancient Roman walls, and who are the bankers who really control the world. And so the Rothschilds, um, uh, Amstel Meyer had five sons, and one of them was put in each country in Europe to control the banking in that particular economy. And there were five daughters as well. And because they married, they did not carry the Rothschild name. But that's a whole nother web of hidden uh, entities or very powerful people and bloodlines. The bloodlines are the most important thing to them in keeping uh, control of the money and keeping it in the families and working together. Okay, well, um, I've I've got a book here that I've just more or less finished reading by Dr. John Coleman called The Conspirators' Hierarchy, The Committee of 300. Are you familiar with that, Lorraine? Oh, yes. And and our our friend Marie Strong is one of them, as well as Henry Kissinger and George H.W. Bush, and, and a lot of fairly familiar names, including, of course, the Queen of England and various other royalty figures. And it is claimed in this book that this is the ultimate secret society, which really has been dictating American foreign policy now since, uh, well, for quite a while, for, you know, a century anyway, um, and as well as, as uh, orchestrating wars around the world. Now, how would they relate then? These, this would simply be the operational end of the, the, the London bankers that you're talking about, and it would include members of those banking entities. Is that the way you would look at it? Yeah, they're they're really the contractors, and they would be members of uh, uh, royal families as well. Um, the, the Queen of the Netherlands, the Queen of Denmark, the King of Spain. Um, um, these entities. Oh, the the King of Denmark. Although I'm sorry, Norway. Although I I've never heard really negative stuff about him as much as the others. Um, they're, Norway's more independent. Um, but it's, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself how have these people stayed in power for centuries and even millennia. And um, they maintain their uh, power by claiming that they have the divine right to rule over other people. But what has happened is over time, the citizenry have um, organized democratic movements which um, which are, are focused on their right to rule themselves. So it's divine right uh, versus individual rights, and this has been a spiritual battle, spiritual warfare, uh, going back to the beginning of time. But the... City of London bankers are a particular uh, entity, and I'd like to read uh, something uh, from the Sunday Herald in England, February 8, 1920. Uh, this is called uh, Churchill, the first to say international Jew. Churchill suppressed article indicting the international Jew reemerges on the Internet. On the above date, Winston Churchill penned a since-suppressed article, Zionism versus Bolshevism, in which he wrote, quote, The Jewish Bolsheviks are producing a philosophy as malevolent as Christianity is benevolent, which, if not arrested, will shatter irretrievably all that Christianity has rendered possible, unquote. Churchill goes on to say the international Jew has forsaken the faith of his forefathers and divorced from his mind all spiritual hopes of the next world. This worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization on the basis of envious malevolence and impossible equality has been steadily growing, unquote. And so... This uh, City of London bankers and, of course, their contractors, the Wall Street bankers, 